Welcome to B2V Podcast. This is another installment of the Survivor Series. I'm Alexi Lindis, and my guest today is Lee Beltman. Hi, Lee. Hi, Alexi. How are you? Uh, I'm doing okay, man. How about you? I am doing great. It's a, a really good thing that you are doing here. I've uh, really enjoyed all your other podcasts with Marcus and Kat and everyone that you've done so far. And I'm really looking forward to be able to talk to this with someone else who's uh, experienced it, as they say. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Um, so what we're what we're talking about today is the troubled teen industry, uh, and something we we as survivors refer to as TTI. Um, and so, Lee, would you like to explain what the troubled teen industry is? Sure thing. Um, Oh, let me take a deep breath here because I can get to going sometimes. Um, the troubled teen industry to me is what is also referenced as the rehabilitation therapeutic community. Um, it uses decisive measures to convince parents that they can fix children when basically they're hustling money, to, you know, because I'm kind of blunt about this stuff. Um, but you know, basically, it starts off with an educational consultant who, you know, a parent will, you know, oh, my kid's in trouble, I need help. They go online, they start looking for places and help, and they come across, you know, go to this wilderness camp or, you know, do this program or that program. And so that's basically what happened with my parents. Um, right. And uh, like I said, I got I didn't even really get introduced to uh, the troubled teen industry till my third boarding school. Okay. So good, you shipped off to a Wentworth Military Academy when I was thirteen was traumatic, you know. I mean, like I said, it was Wentworth Military Academy. Actually, I do believe Kemper Military Academy almost got purchased by either Wasp or NATSEP. I'm not sure which one. Like says, so a lot of the military schools are on the watch list, mm-hmm. and. Um, so like I said, that's why for me when I discuss this stuff, I've discussed it and researched it for, you know, a good five years straight now. And I really understand that this stuff started really, really back in the 1940s with the Brown Schools of Texas and the Aspen Education Group and how that evolved into WASP. And, you know, there's NATSAP and there's different accreditation companies that certify supposedly, I'm doing the air quotes for, you know, that comment there because there's really no oversight. You know, there's, they're hiring people that are not certified to work with, uh, kids with, uh, psychological issues. And, like I said, is, and the fact that these educational consultants get kickbacks from these places is, um, one of the issues I have. But, you know, like I said, is there's a lot of little technical difficulties when you discuss this stuff with other survivors because you guys know this information just as much as I do sometimes. And there's gaps with the information because it's a very small community when it comes to us survivors. Yeah. And me being what is called a CDU first generation clone survivor kind of puts me in a little special niche because the CDU lingo, the profit that were used at the CDU and the, I mean, it was so much manipulation of the mind that, right. um, still to this day I get because I don't get upset because like I, I don't like to be like weak here because like I said is I get angry that it's if people start talking about this stuff around me I get emotional and I'm like hold on a second why am I getting emotional I didn't have the worst of this here I you know was pretty lucky in my you know Wentworth and Oxford Academy then going to the Cascade School which was the CDU knockoff. And, you know, and the fact that there were kids that were abused and molested there is just a fact. A lot of people from my school itself are what I hate to even term because, like I said, they they have a hard time discussing this. They don't want to say that, oh, that counselor might not have been the nicest guy. And that's why I actually, in this discussion, I will be leaving out so many names because I don't want to reference someone who doesn't want to be mentioned in this stuff. I would love for them to come to me and be like, dude, I heard your interview. I'd love to go on that podcast and talk about my experience too. Because, yeah. you know, like I said, is they've come to me asking for help and I haven't been able to do anything. Right. 
And also, you know, it's what you saw was from your perspective and what they saw was from their perspective. You know, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean I, there's been so many books and, you know, um, a friend of uh, mine, Liam Schiff, who passed away, made the CDU documentary. Sorry, Liam was a good friend, and his passing away really hurt. Um, but, um, sorry, let me pull this together a little bit. Um, it's okay, Mom. No, no, I know you get this. <laughs> but, I do. Uh, Liam, yeah, Liam Schiff's documentary was enlightening to me, but also very confusing, because it was referencing Rocky Mountain Academy and Boulder Creek Academy and talking about this stuff and mentioning names, and I'm sitting going, hold on a second, did they work here? And, and because my classmates have gone on to become educational consultants, have worked at Sue's or Outward Bounds or Carl Brooks School was started by um, graduates from Cascade. And I'm friends with people that have graduated from there that kind of explain the story to me. And I'm like, that's really similar to the financing crumbling of what happened with these other places. But now it's been reopened up as another thing. And, and then, like I said, it's, I guess a lot of the reason I'm really emotional is um, Riverview Academy made national news. Yeah. That's Cascade. Wow. Is it that that they are still doing that no bands, no talk, no touch stuff is just it flashed me back there, you know. And like I said, when that happens to any survivor, when they flash back like that, it's so yep. emotionally unstable. And you can you can you can smell it. You can smell that feeling <laughs> in the air. It's it's like you're there. I I get it. I get it. Like <laughs> I get it so much. Like it's like you're in that room again, and you can feel that well well up in your stomach, and sort of that zoom in on you. Yeah, like and, so that's the thing is it flashed me back to my first six months there when I got there and I was so I mean I was 17 years old and I wasn't a small person. Yeah. And, and, and so, but I was sitting there, and they're doing these smush piles, and, 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 and it's I'm like, oh, this is the we. What is going on here? I come from Oklahoma, where everything's kind of conservative, and you know, you don't know right, oh, this. Is right. Crazy. And so, I played the game, and that's the problem I think I have with myself is I drank the Kool Aid. Sure. And, when it's, and it's very hard, you know, when I'm sitting here trying to explain the different workshops and celebrations we did, and how. In the last five years, I've had to study like neurolinguistic programming and trauma-based mind control and large group awareness training and all these different things because one thing leads to another when you research this stuff, mm -hmm. and it's a never-ending rabbit hole. And that's why yeah. I says being able to talk with you, it's like, hey, I'm finally not in this rabbit hole anymore. Right. And that's, to me, you know, it's like, ah. Uh, you're helping me by by letting me help you and other survivors not be afraid to speak out against these thousands of places that currently exist that use, yes. you know, um, four point restraints, electric shock therapy, um, you know, ther like Thorazine, and, and actually the stuff they do to kids. And the uh, juvenile detention center is so atrocious. So yeah. that's not the troubled teen industry. And, and so, like I said, no. that's the thing is that since I did an outward bound and loved it, I loved my outward bound. You know, and then trying to discuss the fact that you know, I went to military school and basically, you know, up at four a.m. shining shoes and brass, getting yelled at by everybody having my total ego torn down and feeling very insecure and having yeah. my whole family, like, basically, that's the hardest thing I think it is to explain to people. As soon as your family ships you off like that, you no longer have a family. It's over. Yeah, it's over. No, it's, you know, it's completely and, and, and over. It's, yeah, and that trust that, you, like I said, is, I was very blessed before my mother passed away because of Maya um, and her article. To me and her had that talk. Yeah. 
You know, and sh- I got to apologize to her because I deserved to go there. You know, that's the thing is I have to accept my part in this. But she should I mean, then, you know, like I said, it's so psychologically abusive. My father shouldn't have been so neglectful. My sister shouldn't have been so freaking, uh, you know, like I said, so there's so many things that lead up to these stories. That yeah, there, so hard there's, to explain. yeah, it's, and it's not, it's not that simple, but what's really simple is, is that kids shouldn't be shipped off anywhere. If, if there's a trouble in the home, it's generally in the home. And it's generally to do with, with whatever has happened before that and the environment that the child is in. You no, know, it's I agree not, so much. It isn't, um, you know, I'm not going to, you know, sorry, I can't condone you saying that because you, you didn't get this, you didn't deserve it. I understand that she was. I get what you're saying. I totally agree with you. I, I know I didn't deserve it, but I know the path I was on, if I hadn't have gotten away from the stuff I was involved with, I might not have lived through some of it. So like I says, I just accept my part in it, but you're right, I totally didn't deserve it. But you might not have lived through Sea-Do either. Do you know what no, I'm no, saying? I, I mean, I'm not going to argue you. I'm not. Hold on. Calm down. Calm down here, please. I no, no, no. I'm not, okay? I'm not arguing um, you. You know, I, I, I want to be I calm. Well, I says, I'm going to get to the runaways and what happens to runaways and what happened to my friends and all the ODs and deaths and suicides that have happened. You know, but one of the blessings I've had in the last two years of my life being much older than you I've had friends of mine from my school call me up with their aunts or uncles or sisters or brothers wanting help with their troubled teen, and I've been able to say, um, your kid's fine. You need to grow up and stop treating your kid like an infidel and listen to them and save them yeah. from getting shipped off to Diamond Ranch Academy. You know, like I said, is um, Riverview Academy. Like I said, I have a list of a 1,000 school names that I try to memorize because yeah. they're on the watch list. And yeah, I, yeah. And I have notifications. So, like I said, is it so? When you start talking to people like this, it's that's one of the things that's been the hardest thing for me the last ten to fifteen years. Is when I'm talking to other survivors, not survivors, excuse me. When I'm talking to non-survivors, there's always a point where they just their mouth opens up, that their eyes glaze over, and they're just like, "Oh my God!" And I'm at that point, I'm like, "They'll never understand this. They can't. Yeah. They didn't experience it." They don't understand confrontational therapy Yeah, and, and sitting in a circle three times a week yelling at each other, if not worse, you know, with some of the uh, dishes. Like I said, it was slave labor. That's one of the things is I'm sitting there chopping wood to heat the house, running dishes, crews, and doing all this stuff. And that's one of the things is in the last two or three years only, I've been talking with other survivors and other people from Cascade, and I noticed something that was enlightening to me so much. We almost speak a different language. Yeah. And it, and it almost comes down yeah. to which location you went to, what kind of, like, at Cascade we had bands, which is no touch, no talk with people. Right. And then we had dishes. If you, you know, like I said, if you didn't, if you got caught with your shirt untucked, you might have to do dishes one night. And he had to report to the dining hall at 7 p.m. after dinner. And basically, from anywhere from two to three hours, you were scrubbing dishes or cleaning windows or vacuuming the library or, you know, doing stuff. So yeah, these schools, like I said, is they make so much money. <sighs> Excuse me, sorry. Um, that you know they try to explain to people about the um, 460 million dollars. That, that um, the CRC Help Group, um, who owns AEG, who runs a month, like says, like, says I can reference these different articles about you know the WASP Survivor page or the Heal Online page. Yeah. <laughs> or like says, there's four, it's WikiLinks, which is where the CDU Lingo page is, which actually has the definition of the terms that they use at these different mm-hmm. schools and stuff. But there's so much information also on some of these pages that is not 100% correct that that's yeah. why I'm very careful because I don't want people having to experience what I've had to experience these last – I mean, these last five years of my life have been a living hell, to be honest with you. 
You know, yeah. I'm sure you're going through a lot of this stuff these last year too, because you know it's so much fresher for you and all the people that survived heritage. And that's the thing is, well, was, to for me, me, for me, I got out. Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but no, go ahead, I got out. I, I got out in um, 2000, and uh, I didn't start to unravel this until about six or seven years ago. And I started, because I got the internet, and I found Nick Galea's film uh, over the GW. And I was instantly triggered and instantly back in program. And I love Nick. I love Nick and his work. He's amazing. Yeah. Um, so I I watched that, and then I started to, you know, look for my friends who were, you know, in program with me, and I, I couldn't really find anyone, and I couldn't find any groups or anything. And I, I couldn't figure, you know, I didn't really know how to use Google that well, so I couldn't, you know, say, you know, heritage school abuse or, you know, NATSAP abuse. So I went from that movie, I emailed Nick, and then... I found the survivor group on Facebook of Straight Inc. And it was from there that it sort of opened up everything else and all the other places. And, of course, I read that uh, Maya Salovitz article. um, uh, What's it called? Um, The cult that spawned the troubled teen industry. Right. And, And that, you know, that opened up a whole can of worms. But it, you know, then I... I jumped into, um, almost instantly I jumped into being an activist and starting an operation with Anonymous and trying to fight these, and try to fight these places. Because I wanted, well, more than that, I wanted to get news to cover these places. You know, media wasn't covering them. And there really was no way to get, you know, anyone to do any proper journalistic, you know, stuff even through that. Um, but I sort of discovered my own story while fighting this. And, uh, you know, it, it's been, it's been an amazing thing for me to be able to, you know, now read an article because I, I certainly couldn't, even when I started the operation, I was posting articles that I couldn't, couldn't read about. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't go. Um, and, like, you know, to figure out the architecture for me has been a massive relief. I don't know about you, but to understand it, at least to have an understanding of it all. You know, I came out of there and I I, I certainly couldn't, you know, I didn't have the, the, the vocabulary to explain what had just happened to me. I didn't have any way of sort of, like, understanding what had just happened, but I fucking knew that I was, you know, I had just been through absolute nightmare, you know, and that there, all this stuff started replaying in my head. And when I tried to speak to my parents, I got shut down and that caused me to stop talking for two years. And I, I just stopped talking because I didn't know how to explain anything anymore. And I was trying to figure it all out in my head. I guess and I find... Yeah. Well, my family hasn't spoken to me in three and a half years now. Since right. the day my mother died, basically, my family has ignored me because I was going to them with the information about, you know, um, Robert Litchfield, Mitt Romney, Mel Washerman, Nelson Blar, yeah. Scared Straight, Straight Inc., you know, C2 Inc., C2 Incorporated, and and then Aspen Educators, and they just kind of basically like, we're sick and tired of you talking about child abuse and pedophilia. Feel you abuse, and I'm like, wow. And so, yeah, they just was was scared straight connected to straight ink. Yeah, yeah, the tough love program and all that stuff kind of developed out of 1940 in Texas with the Brown Schools of Texas. Interesting. And then when Robert Litchfield, Mel Simlar, and Mel Washerman, and all them, when like I said, is when Wasp Pershup the C2 Inc. stuff is when it all links together for me with the Nats, that stuff. And, you know, I, you know, like I said, that's one of the great things about what you just said. You know, with this knowledge comes a lot of responsibility. Yeah. And, you know, I have friends that have connections with Nats, that schools. And, and I yeah. like, 
don't want to lose that friendship over the fact that they left the school I was at, you know, went and worked at Carlbrook or went and worked at Sue's, and, you know, they're trying to do what's in the kids' best intentions. And, um, you know, that's it's a very sticky situation for me because I have so many friends that are survivors. And yeah. then I, I it gets to the point where I'm like, I mean, I've gotten into a fight and I'm not friends with someone because of that word alone. She's like, I don't want to be a survivor. And I'm like, you're not a survivor. You're not a victim anymore. You're you're better than that. But trying to explain that to some people who like being broken sometimes and, and like to play that little, you know, oh, woe is me. I had bad parents. I didn't get this, this, and this in life. It's kind of hard to hear them complain after all these years of hearing it over and over again. And I'm like, you know, listen, there's a solution here. If we work together and stop arguing with each other about stupid politics, or I don't even know, because like, I've gotten into so many stupid fights in the last five years because of this stuff. And, yeah. and, and, and like I said, and I have victims from the Slick of Hope Girls Ranch that were molested come to me, and I'm like, could tell them when to call the FBI, call SIA, call WA, and like I said, nothing happened. And that was kind of the day I really had the wake up call that, oh my God, I'm losing friends that I really care about because of this need to get this to change. But yet, it seems like people only are willing to go so far. And, and then their yeah. life become more important, and then you know their work becomes more important, or like that stuff. And like I says, I'm very blessed in life that right now I'm not needing to work, and I can spend a lot of time researching all these new schools, and you know try to keep track of counselors and where they work and which ones. You know, like I says, and that's it got to be where I was very isolating two years ago. I don't like talking to other people because it's it feels like it's a waste of my time. You know, actually, I, I feel talk like to the survivors I, I, today. It's I, the days I can talk with you. <laughs> I, I actually, I actually, that's an interesting thing because I had a conversation with another survivor about this in uh, DM. How, like, generally, um, in social situations, most people just talk, and they're not actually talking about anything. They're just blabbing away. And right. most people do that all day, and it's generally not about anything at all. I think us survivors have a really hard time with that because we were basically, you know, on levels for, you know, well, I know that I was on, you know, level one multiple, multiple times for probably most of my stay, probably a good year or two, well, I'd say of the four years, I'd say a good two and a half years of that were spent on level one where I couldn't actually talk to anyone, you know? And that's, to me, I don't understand that because we didn't have a level one, level two system where I was at. Right, right. Okay, so let me explain. Um, so I, I came into the program and I mean, I'll talk to you about heritage because Deborah was another can of worms and that was my first place. And that, I mean, that also had a level system, but uh, it, it, it wasn't... Uh, it, it, it's different, and, and I'll explain that maybe at some point. But um, let me stick with heritage for now, because that's usually my main theme. Um, so in heritage, you come in and you have absolutely no rights. You can't talk at all, and you sit in a chair. And you basically, when everyone else is on unit talking to each other, you're not allowed to talk. And there's a TV on, but you're on the side of the unit. But the TV, you know, if the TV's on, you're on the side of the unit where the TV isn't viewable, so you're not allowed to watch, and you're basically just writing. Um, you know, I, I was writing a lot of things about sort of like, you know, why I shouldn't be in the chair, you know, what got me in the chair, you know, all of these things like that. Um, and then every week, uh, all of the staff would meet in this meeting that we weren't allowed to go to, and it was called the treatment team meeting. And that was where all the levels were decided. And the staff would come back onto the unit and stand at the board, and we weren't allowed to, like, ask him any questions about our levels during that. If that happened, we got we got into trouble and possibly lost our level. But um, 
so he would sort of fill in on the board, you know, what level, you know, you were for that week. And if you got up to level two, then you could you come out of that area and you could talk and you could hang out, but you, you still had, like, I mean, your privileges were low. You couldn't go off campus. You couldn't, you know, when everyone else was going off campus for sort of these trips that, you know, I didn't discover until, like, two years in because I didn't actually go because I started AWOLing and, and became run risk. Um, but, uh, then like on level three, you, you kind of begin to get a bit more privileges. Like you're allowed to have like headphones and you can listen to the radio, uh, for like a half hour a day and you can check out onto the porch for five minutes at a time, but you have to check in within that five minutes. Otherwise you'll lose your privilege to do that, you know, and. I mean, like, the, the, the day-to-day life comes in, too, with this, and I'd, I'd have to talk about that, too, you know, like, how sort of, you know, you, we were woken up at 7, and, you know, we went to breakfast and got med, like, and, and the whole med shuffle was the most ridiculous thing, because it's every fucking unit, you know, trying to get into this small med room in the morning. So we were just, like, stood outside in backed-up lines sometimes, if the nurses weren't, you know, ready. So we would be standing in the fucking freezing cold wind in the morning, like first thing in the morning, you know, having to stand in line and be quiet. That's, yeah, Yeah. we had the same thing, but it was a little different because ours was inside. But, I mean, it's so amazing to hear you talking about this stuff because one of the things that I've noticed is people that went to the Heritage, they, they they talk like they went to prison. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry to say it kind of bluntly, but units, you know, standing in yeah. the deadline. The med, the, I'm like going, oh my god, this sounds like. And I'm like going, that's the stuff that I was sitting there going, I, I was institutionalized. Yeah, and I actually have done some prison time, so that was the mindset that I'm like going, I can't ever get out of that mindset that I yeah. was brainwashed into there, and that's why it's so easy for me to get triggered. And react in a negative way when someone says something that I don't agree with, and I'll sure. fly off the handle and go after them. And you know, like I said, it's sure. to me, I'm like going, I'm not verbally abusing you. What are you talking about, you sensitive snowflakes? And and so yeah. like I said, it's been able to make me be able to have a much more intelligent conversation these last few years with other survivors, sure. and to have those breakthrough moments where we're like going, yes, and it's so similar, but it's so different. Yeah. And like I said, I remember distinctly my being 17 years old, you know, parents have found drugs in my room, so I'm getting shipped off to California, you know, getting off the plane, getting in a rental car, driving an hour out of Redding, California, to the middle of BFE Mountains um, in Northern California, up near Oregon, between Mount Lassen and Mount Shasta. And I knew yeah. it was beautiful. I'm not going to lie and say it wasn't beautiful. Mm-hmm. But, I remember crossing that cattle garden, and once I crossed that cattle guard, it was like my life changed. You know, mm-hmm. they're at the door, opening the door for the car. <laughs> you know, I had a big brother that was, hey, this guy's going to give you a tour of the school. Right. Go talk to your dad in the admissions building, blah, blah, blah. Next thing you know, my dad's gone, and I'm there. Yeah. And yeah. like I said, I didn't leave the campus for a year. They had a big brother, little brother program, and basically you had to earn privileges. Like I said, that's the thing is you guys had to sit and do that isolation writing stuff. We didn't have to do that. You know, we were, you know, here, don't break the rules. If you break the rules, you have to do dishes. You can't. And like I said, it was so weird because we couldn't talk about certain music. You know, we could. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, so right. Like, what what kind cool. of music couldn't you talk about? Uh, anything that was, I mean, Pink Floyd, The Doors, anything drug related, bad, like I said, what they yeah. termed bad. Yeah, but, Think, you know, it was Cat- the same in our program, The Doors, Pink Floyd, um, wait, Marilyn Manson, Manson Ozzy yeah. Osbourne, <laughs> Metallica, yeah, Tool, like all Stevens of those. And the Beatles, heck yeah, all the Cat Stevens and Beatles you want. <laughs> but anyway, um, brother, if, if you wouldn't mind that, I'll, I'll finish just laying out a day for you in my program, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, definitely. Um, so, actually, so we, we were woken up and, like, we had, to, we had to make our bed perfectly at that point. Like, that was the first thing we had to do. And then we had unit jobs 
And this is before we went off to get meds and got frozen every morning by the Utah wind that, that flew down the Provo Canyon at us uh, at like, you know, 40 miles per hour every fucking morning. Um, and then we went to get breakfast and then we went back to the unit and then we would go to school and the girls would go to rack. The girls were separated from us on campus. Um, the girls would go to rack and we would go to school and then that would change over at noon. And that was our end of the end of the school. So I had like four classes at school, which was a joke. I mean, it was really a joke. I don't know where they got these teachers from. They were hilarious, but it was kind of funny. I mean, some of it was, was okay, but not, you know, not really. I mean, kids were still being drug out of there and restrained and isolated if they didn't sit in class or they were being rowdy or, you know, I mean, it was, this whole thing is sort of like, like, stop, go, stop, go constantly because of other kids, you know, um, and because of, you know, sometimes my behavior too. Um, and then rack in the afternoon was recreational therapy. It was usually something sport related, but sometimes we did these sort of weird, like, exercises, like, where we would all have to, like, get onto these, like, blocks and walk with these ropes on them. Or we had to, like, climb this wall all together and get over this wall, this really tall wall all together, but without anyone sort of, like, helping us. And we weren't allowed to talk during these exercises. Like, they were... And then we'd go back to the unit and and there would be, like, an afternoon group almost every day. And then we'd clean again. And then we'd go do unit jobs and have dinner. Oh, uh, not unit jobs, campus jobs, sorry, because, again, like your program, we were basically slave laborers, and we were basically keeping the entire campus spotless for them, and that was basically what was going on. We were running the campus for them, you know, as far as cleaning, cleaning-wise, you know. Um, yeah. uh, and uh, in the evening, then we'd have, like, an, uh, a couple of hours of downtime sometimes if if we hadn't gone off campus for a trip or something, which happened usually once once a week, we were like scheduled for trips. Each, each unit uh, had had a different day for a trip, and, like that would be to like a park or like you know um, like a museum or something, you know. Mm-hmm. And that would only be for upper levels. It would sort of like drank the Kool Aid. Um, level four was. A little different because when you became level four, you kind of got a bit more privilege in terms of being staffed too. And you were now sort of allowed to, uh, call out other kids, particularly during group. It was your job to sort of run the group and therefore you weren't being called out during the attack therapy. It was sort of a way for you to avoid that. I mean, and of course, there were only like there were only like four or five level fours at the time on the unit. You know, there would never be more than that. The level system was just so unfair, anyway. Um, but clearly, it was rigged too. Um, could someone move up then, the level systems fast? Yeah, they could, but you like you. There, there was, there was a clear, like, differential, differential between kids who were there because of course. So they had no mental problems, generally. Kids mm-hmm. who were there because of, of mental health issues. And kids who were there because of behavioral issues. And that right. separation, like, was always clear. And so if a kid came in who was there because of course, generally they'd move through the level system with ease. And, Generally, they wouldn't, you know, have problems following such sort of, like, maniacal... I mean, it was just mentally wearing, all of it, you know, the whole program. It was just so mentally wearing that you would slip up, mm-hmm. you know? Right, I get you. And, and that if, if, you know, someone like me, I, I had, you know, I had severe anxiety problems from brain trauma you know, that I experienced when I was 12. So it wasn't like I was, 
I was able to do the things that they, they were expecting me to do every day, like stand perfectly in a line when I'm fucking freezing cold, you know, and not lose my cool for, you know, an hour or two when I'm staring at a wall, sitting at work, or writing and doing a writing assignment, you know? I but mean, no, it just it? wasn't possible. I mean, that's to me, I mean, at, at that age, what you endured is so traumatic. That that's why I love talking to other people like you. I mean, it, it's it's I can't explain doing that to people, you know. And, and and since that didn't happen at Cascade the same way, but it did happen the mm-hmm. exact same way, you know. And like I said, like I said at Cascade, it was. Can I try to explain Cascade to you real quick? Yeah, please. Okay, like I said, I got there. I had a big brother. Basically, the same thing, you know. Get up in the morning, make your bed. Uh, actually, it was kind of funny. We, I never slept in my bed. I slept on top of my made bed, so every morning all I had to do was kind of fix it. But the Smart. clothes had to be, you know, two finger widths apart. Everything in the drawer had to be a certain way. Every morning mm-hmm. you had a mm-hmm. dorm inspection. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And then there were proctors. The proctors, right. were the students had been there over a year, had gotten that privilege to be the proctor, and they they, they had the dorm heads. So it was a very hierarchical system. <laughs> Every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we had forums or rap sessions. And yeah. I'd say I wanted to indict someone. I would go to the forum box and fill a little request. Okay. So like said, the ones who drank the Kool-Aid and were doing all the forum requests and blah, 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 they were the ones who got the privileges, got to listen to the level one music. So it was right. this total reward to playing the game uh, system. Right. And then, like I said, it was my first three months there was basically, you know, going to class, doing forums, um, Saturday cleaning crew, Saturday work crew, Sunday, you know, they did kind of, you know, games and, and activities on Sundays that were kind of cool, actually. And yeah. Then, um, but then, like I said, after three months, you did what was called the Truth Workshop. Or, I mean, it was actually okay. two celebrations. We had three celebrations and then workshops after the celebrations. Okay. The first celebration was called the Truth. The second one was called the Youth. And the third one was called the Friends. And basically, the Truth is about, you know, the truth self sets you free. And one of the, like, things that happened in that that was really traumatic was they pulled out this thing called the chalkboard. Okay. And you had, like I said, the very first word they even wrote down on the chalkboard was masturbation. So basically, after you'd had a form encounter group, you know, then ate dinner, you came back and you have this, they pull out Pinocchio, and it's basically, get, get on this, tell us all your dirt kind of stuff. Yeah. But it's also, you know, 13-year-old girl who was sitting in there because her parents died and her aunt and uncle didn't know what to do with her because she was messed up, look out for a place for a troubled teen, thinking it was help along those lines, not knowing yeah. it was that kind of school. And then there's me, 17 years old, you know, and then there's other people like this. So we had had sexual experiences and knew about life a little bit. And there's other people who are like, and, and then people are talking about being raped, you know, bestiality, you know. And so like I said, as it was to me, that experience alone is like something I do not ever discuss with anyone unless they're a survivor. Yeah. And, you know, like I said, and then like I said, and after that, you know, like I said, when it's over, because like they would do it on the weekend. So you'd go in on a Friday afternoon, come out on Sunday, and we, when you come out, you know, like the whole, they'd get the whole entire house. That's what they call it. They call it the house. And okay. everyone would come out and, like, go give their big brother a hug and get up and kind of do a little thing. So it kind of, it was, they kind of always made it kind of like, like that system. And then you did the youth, which is all about finding your little boy and finding your inner child and blah, blah, blah. Then you do the friends, which is, about being friends and like not turning your back on each other and da 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 da. da. Even so though you you have to turn your friend, you have to turn your back yeah, on each other. Yeah, basically. Right. You okay. Yeah. Out, you're doing dishes and you're so scared that you know, oh, I did, did I pop off in front of this person? Did I did I wink at this person? And it might be considered a sex contract. And, right. And so that's the stuff that you get. But trying to explain that to other people are like, well, what's a sex contract? And you're like. Well, it's flirting, basically. <laughs> yeah, right? Being normal, being human. Yeah, right. And it wasn't allowed there, though. And so, like I said, so that whole no dating rules and the and like, yeah. we didn't have rules. It was agreements because we agreed to be there because we weren't splitting. 
So it was just total yeah. mind manipulation. And so like I said, and like I said, you weren't allowed to leave the campus really for a year. Uh, like I said, I remember me because I was from Oklahoma. My parents came up and I was allowed to do an overnight earlier than a lot of people in my family were. And, and so like I said, so there were certain privileges given to certain people if they were getting by, we'll say. And I was, I definitely, I knew I was there from day one. You know, yeah. I had spent 10 days in a psychiatric ward because so I tried to run away from home to try to get out of going there. Right. And, uh, yeah, so like I said, so then I'm, do the friends, nine months, you start getting privileges, you're now on the friends committee, you get on the dishes committee, you're basically running the school, you know? Right. And, and then you do this thing called the Heroes, which was based off of the, um, the Les Miserables play. So then right. we're playing that music, and that, like I said, for me, they changed the program after I graduated, and they started doing the stuff I didn't do until I was there a year, way earlier. Yeah. And that was the very first time they pulled out the pillows and the socks. And I'm like, well, what the heck is going on here? And they're like, put the socks on. They start playing this music, and they're like, run anger. Tell your, tell that pillow what you really – and it's like I said, so next thing you know, an hour later, everyone's beating the hell out of these pillows screaming at the yeah. top of their lungs. And, I mean, really, I remember one of my friends just having exploded blood vessels all on his neck from how hard he was screaming at his father. And Ooh. I'm like going, dude, your dad's a little strict, but Jesus, what the hell's going on here? Where did this come? And it's like this. And, and I realized that that was what the school was intending to do. Of course. They want us to get to that animal basic nature. Yeah. And that's the thing is, and that's the thing is, it's that part of me that they made me become aware of that I don't like. I know it's there. Yeah. I hate when it explodes out on people, but, you know, for me to have a relationship with my father today, I'm like going, I'm trying not to hold the fact that he holds how much the school cost over my head. And this yeah. and this and this and this manipulation after, you know, and like says, and so there's so many things that I didn't realize were I just held inside ever since the day I graduated from there. I mean, I went to college and wasn't really able to have a normal college experience because there was no aftercare. Yeah. You know, there was no, here, you're going back into society. You've lived in a very cloistered society for two years. Here's how you process and deal with this stuff. And that's why I love talking to people and love trying to become more of an activist because I see there's, tens of thousands of kids graduating from these schools every day who are going to need this assistance that's not there for them right now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like I said, and it's been so hard for me to wrap my brain around these last two years alone with, um, I live in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, there's the Shadow Mountain Psychiatric Treatment Facility that's connected to Timberlawn in Dallas, which is owned by Universal Healthcare Services. Yeah. Which connects to some other places and that connects to Aspen Education Group in some weird way. It's like I said, it's such a mess for me that I have to reference the WASP survivor page, healonline.com, you know, Fortnite, Sia.com, you know, because me and Jody Hobbs don't always see eye to eye on everything, but I love the lady and I love her passion for this work. Yeah. And that's one of the things is I, I, I owe a lot of people apologies, you know. Three years ago when I was just starting to really understand this stuff, I was so angry and took it out on people that I was friends with. And like I said, is and, and, you know, um, a lot of people didn't know my best friend committed suicide. My sister committed suicide a year after that. Then my mom died a year after that. I'm really sorry, Lee. No, it's okay, dude. It's life, you know. And that's Yeah. But it was going through that loss, though, that really made me get my voice. And, and we want to speak out themselves. There's a lot of mentally unstable people that need a lot of help. And if the government is taking money out of the mental health association and re certifying and regulating the troubled teen therapeutic community, that's a big issue. And that's what I've seen the last 10 years in Oklahoma just happening in the worst and worst way because they'd rather institutionalize and put kids that are, like says, juvenile defenders into juvie hall than they would into a good program that might get them an education, learning how to code on the computer and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, and like I said, I'm grateful every day. I mean, uh, and passion, uh, Mark Babbitt. There's a 
very few people in my life that I owe an eternity of gratitude to. You. You. I love you, you man. I'm, I love you, man. I'm giving I'm you a big you hug right now. Thank you. I guess it is. I hate that I get this emotional about this, but I'm just sitting here now going, okay, there's a school in Missouri that a girl is getting molested at probably right now. Oh, shit. There's a school in every state that a girl is probably getting molested at right now. Right now. And that's why I'm just so passionate about this, and it gets me upset because I'm sitting when I have nieces and nephews that my sisters who refuse to speak to me that I care about want to talk to because I want to make sure they're safe. Yeah. You know, but I yeah. guess I had a little learning to do. You know, like I said, is seeing people using these tactics, you know, and then in the last three years, I've actually gone to some of the locations that are on the watch list and pretended I was an educational consultant and taking a tour. So Jesus it's just crazy Christ. to walk into these places and look at them and be like, okay, you know, and that's one of the things is that, you know, I guess hearing you talk, it clicks something with me. I know a girl that went to Heritage. I can't think of her name right now. I know she went okay. to Heritage because she's so proud of it because she split from Cascade and got sent there. And she doesn't really have a problem with it, but I understand. Like I said, that's one of the things I've been trying to understand is, you know, hey, you know, I, I get it wasn't Provo Canyon school, so you weren't probably in four-point restraints getting electric shock therapy, but... Yeah, well, here's, here's the thing, right? So I there was another part to my... So basically, if someone acted out on the unit or couldn't sit in their chair and do their writing assignment, then... The response team was called, which was usually these big guys who would show up, hot dog, and they would remove you from the unit. And sometimes there, you know, it would be this whole big thing where everybody on the unit would move to the stairs, all the kids. So they wouldn't see, but you would hear what was going on if a kid started fighting on the unit with the, those staff members. Yeah. Because those I, staff I, members were trained. And they would I, drag you I, off. They would drag you off to this place called ISU, which was this this basement in Heritage that had these timeout rooms in it and the isolation tanks. Do I've heard about that stuff? Yeah, and so I oh my god, that's so I spent I spent three months one time down there, and there was a there was a kid who had been living down there for eight months when I got down there, and he terminated by turning 18 while down there. Like, they were still taking funding for this kid who was, like, stuck in this tiny little box all day. And, like, when he left, there were these scratches on the wall that he had made markings of how many days he had left. And he was slicing them off to the side for the you know, to count each one, yeah. you know, and he was, he was just like, he had drawn things on the wall with this, I don't know what he had used in there, but, because they were just so, you know, they were bare room, white room, and, uh, so, you know, I, I, I lived a good majority of my first two years down there, too, um, until, you know, I was broken, and I started to drink the Kool-Aid. Uh, when uh, my therapist brought me down a letter that was written by one of my friends from the unit, someone that I kind of liked, that he was cool, and he had written it all in colors. And, you know, I hadn't seen colors in forever. But Pat had worked up to a level five, and he was now going off campus by himself for a short time every day. You know, and, and, and he told me how great it was and how that was what I should do, you know, and it would be better for me if, the, you know, I did that. Yeah. And it broke me. It uh, broke it me. Broke and me I came, anybody. and I came back to, uh, came back to Yin and I started to work the program. And I started to drink the Kool Aid. Yeah, dude, I'm sorry, but good for you. I know it sucks sometimes, but good for you, because you would have lost your sanity if you had fought that stuff any longer. 
That's yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't, I, I couldn't anymore. Yeah, like I said, that's funny. If I hadn't drank the Kool-Aid, I don't know where my mind would be today. I don't know if I could process and understand the yeah. emotional depths that I've had to get to to get through this. And a lot of people yeah. never get that. Yeah. You know, because that's me being who I am and, and spending the last five years, you know, I, I've got friends from Tranquility Bay, Calcum by the Sea, you know, Lighthouse, uh, Lester Roloff Evangelical School in Texas, yeah. uh, the Agape School. So, like I said, so them coming to me and telling me about the dog cages they had to be in and, and the encounter boxing confrontation matches they were doing, that's when my yeah. mind started going, oh, my God, I didn't have it as bad as if I had split from Cascade. And that yeah. was also when I started doing what you did and I started going, where's my friends that I went to school with? And then I started thinking about, oh, yeah, because, like, the difference, I guess, uh, when someone was acting up at Cascade, they were either just ignored and put on bands or – I had to deal with it because I was a bigger guy right. and some of the staff did. So, like, so that was really the thing, the depth of it there. Yeah. But yeah, if they got, you know, like I said, that's why to me, you're saying here it is. I'm like, oh, that's, well, that's that Provo Canyon place. Oh my God. That was the place that they always threatened to send us if we didn't yeah. make it at Cascade. So there was this big fear there about that. Provo Canyon. Provo Canyon was across the hill from Heritage. They're very close to each other. Yeah, but see, they always threaten us with that Provo Canyon school, and like, so yeah. they, every people coming back at Heritage, I'm like, oh, I forget it, they're different locations. Yeah. So is, that's one of the great things about having this discussion is, it is that close sometimes. Yes, you're in a city, you might have a boarding school within 100 miles of you that this is going on at right now, anybody who's hearing this. Yeah. And that was a hard truth I had to swallow a couple of years ago, because I couldn't do, I couldn't, I've been trying to get it to change and have people help me out with this stuff. And the only thing that's really happened is I've lost a lot of friends in my family. <laughs> so, yeah. But the friends I've made in the process and the fact that these people support me do or die. Yeah. And, and some of the things I've dealt with these last two years, helping a few kids and their parents reconnect and not have that break that happens. Is yeah. The only reward I need. That's the only reward. Like, so there's no money in this for me. I don't care. I'll spend a thousand dollars every month if I have to, to help a survivor get through their day-to-day existence even, because I know what it's like when you're sitting there alone at night and you don't have anyone that understands this, then you need someone to talk to and you don't know who to call. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, that's why it says you and Marcus being friends, it's like, dude, I have Laura. I have, you know, there's so many friends that I have from the Cascade School that I could spend an hour listing them all because... I owe them an yeah. eternal gratitude because they get this. They love calling me up and going, hey, did you hear about this? Da, 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 da. And I'm like going, holy crap, right. that's insane. <laughs> and, and, yeah, like I said, so we've had some just, like this these last year we're talking about the fact that this is going on, the fact that Cascade made the national news last week since it's, like I said, Cascade went from Cascade to, I think, Shepherd's Ranch, and then it became Julian Academy, and now it's uh, a Riverview Christian Academy. Right. And, and so, like I said, definitely right. that was so shocking to me to read that the, that gay aversion therapy has turned into what Cascade is doing now, or uh, Riverview Christian Academy is doing, because they're homophobic. And with yeah. my uncle being gay and my aunt, my, uh, aunt being gay, uh, I've always been friendly with the gays, you know, and so like I said, that's yeah. one of the things is I get into debates with people and I'm like going, hold on a second, I already know you're democratic and you're Bernie, blah, 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 blah. I'm making jokes about some of this stuff. You need it. We've been friends for too long to let this stupid. And so that's the greatest thing that's happened in my life in the last year is to be able to not get into stupid arguments with people and be able yeah. to have those heart to heart one on ones that mean everything. Yes, absolutely. And not waste time or words or energy. Like, it's such a big thing. I mean, I have problems with, like, anger outbursts, and it's uncontrollable when it starts. But, you know, I'm I'm beginning to realize where that's stemming from. I probably do need to get help for that at some point. You know, it's not something where I'm violent, but I, I definitely get verbally aggressive and abusive at times. You know, it's it's tough for me. No, I'm the same way. I mean, I'm way older than you, and I totally like road rage. (laughs) Yeah. I totally get it. And, yeah, 
that's the thing is I'm really glad you're doing this because this is your own therapy. This is how. Yeah, we it's my therapy. It. Yeah. This is how that's I get the, through it. Yeah. Right. And that's the only thing I know. Like, I've done a lot of interviews with people. Uh, some of my interviews in the past, I'm not that proud of. Sure. But, you know, um, it's a learning experience for me. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to process and understand, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder and the fact that I get nervous a little more easier than most people do. And Yeah. And then, like I said, is that that's one of the things you're correct. I, I know when I start really trying to process and think about this stuff and trying to explain it verbally, I get so tongue-tied sometimes. Yeah. But it's there's so much to explain. And also, we don't just know, you know, our stories. We know the entire fucking rabbit hole, or at least we've yeah. seen parts of it, you know? I mean, and it, it, it's like, do you, like, oh, oh, you want to know what happened to me? Cool. Do you have, like, four days? You yeah. know, because i got to start exactly. here, and then I'm going to be over here, and then I'm going to show you this. And, you know, that's just 1950. <laughs> yeah. I, Liam Schiff's documentary, Surviving Sea Doo which is yeah. surviving CD with its own webpage even. Yeah. I used to tell people about that page, but then they stopped talking to me. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, okay, yeah. there's a, there's a, most people, if they get to know me, they, you know, get to know me, and we get along great. Otherwise, I don't care to open up to people anymore because people are mean. Yeah. You know, and, and people, if they don't get this stuff, they, you know, will be like, and that was, I will say this, one of the things I've learned the last two years, um, teen choice, scared straight, survivors of those programs are the most active in this organization of survivors. Yeah. And they're the most passionate, too. And, and like I said, that's, it took me a long time to understand, oh, shit, since in my elementary, junior high days, that program came to my school and did talks because they were here in Tulsa. Right. When I did this school afterwards, I'm kind of double. Uh, I did two different programs here, but I didn't realize yeah. it until much later in life. Like says, and then being a person who supports recovery, blah blah blah. I like to be very clear with people about you know each person has their own path. You know each person has their own beliefs. I don't care what you believe. That's you know I, I've had those discussions with people. You know, let's talk about what we can do to change the current situation in our education department in America so that these kids are getting the lives they deserve and not being shuffled around because of tax revenue. And it comes down right. to almost that simple of a thing when it comes to the insurance industry and tax revenue and in this stuff. Of course. That's what I didn't understand. Like I said, when I had PhD doctors who were educational consultants coming at me saying I didn't know anything and I'm like going, um, I'm not mentioning your name because you worked at Carl Brook or you did this thing and this and and, and you're on the watch list actually. You know, I says but I says I know they're good people. So I says I've yeah. lost a lot of people and I says it was losing the friends that I cared about the most that I expected to call me on the phone and talk it out with me is what really hurt the most, but it also gave me the fortitude to keep pressing forward and make new friends like you. I mean, I had a kid two weeks ago who heard an interview I did over two years ago, contact me on Facebook Messenger, and he's like, I graduated from Carl Book the year it closed down. Would you mind talking to me about this stuff? And he's like, knows all my people that I went to school with that are, became counselors and worked there. And so, like I said, it's just, to me, that conversation, you know, this conversation here, are things I can't show enough gratitude for because it lets me get this off my chest. It lets you, you process and get some of this stuff off of your chest and feel like, you know, because you know this stuff is getting ready to explode. Yeah. You know, like I've been telling that to people for three years. There's so much pedophilia abuse involved here. Yeah. That the psychological abuse and child abuse come secondary. And yeah. I need to get over my crap <laughs> so I can help kids. Because I don't have any children of my own because I, I, I was but, I never wanted kids because I didn't want to bring kids into this world because of my experiences. Yeah. I mean, so, I, I feel like I feel like it's so important that we have a space to talk, too. And, I mean, yeah. we're just having a conversation about it. You know, we're just sharing with, with each other. You know, yeah, and it's so fun. nice that, you know, others can hear this maybe, you know. Yeah, and like so that's they have did they have smushing where you were? Do they what? have what? 
It was called Smush Piles, where y'all like laid around and listened to music together. Whoa, we did do something like that. Yeah. See, they did. Yeah, we did. Do, yeah. How long did you do that for? Like, how long was like, each session? Oh, like so it was like last lights at night, like thirty minutes long, and then you go to bed. But then sometimes it would be three hours on a Sunday listening to music, doing smush pies yeah. with friends. Yeah, something like that. We did something. I can't. And I did We did that during rec therapy. therapy. But yeah, yeah, tell me about that. See, like, since you all did it as a part of your therapy stuff, we just did it as a, uh, we're a family, you know, and I was, like I so said, that was one of the things is I was like, this is kind of, because it was only like boy, boy, girl, girl, yeah. smush pies. But the male counselors and the female counselors that rule was bent a little bit, we'll say. Right. And that was, like I said, is talking to the survivors of the Cascade School and the Cedar Schools, the females, not the males, just the females. They are so, because oh, I don't know how to say this in a nice way, so I guess I'm just going to say it, but because of that issue, they have adult male issues, you know, and, and they have sure uh, business and, and like this, so... They're not really wanting, like, the ones that have gotten into good relationships, they're amazing relationships, but most of them are very dysfunctional, yelling, screaming, and they don't last very long. And that's, like I said, that was when I was looking at my own life going, wow, I'm, I'm not that different from them. I don't, I can't keep a relationship very long. I get, same. Yeah. It's really tough, man. I get fear, too. He says, you're going to change your life doing what you're doing. And you're going to change about a lot of other people's lives. And like I said, I wish I would have woken up to this stuff many years before I did. <laughs> well, thank you, know, you so I, much. I mean, trust me, talking with Marcus and, like I said, as my friend Laura Masterson and so many other people these last year. I mean, really talking to Marcus today was just, I was like, oh, my God, this dude gets it. He really gets that, he, you know. No, he does. Hey, oh, yeah, no, trust me, I know he does. And that was, like I said, I'm sitting going, I'm looking forward to talking to him and maybe doing an interview with him later on. That's yeah, I, I'm looking forward to that, too. So, you know, like I said, that's one of the things. Is it's when you start looking into, like, Warner Earhart seminar training and the large group awareness training and life spring and landmark education and the evolution of the troubled teen industry from 1942 to today, it's, yeah. it's a huge spider web. That's growing, yeah. not getting any smaller. No. And like and like with And then you have like and then you have like programs like Fidu that that create staff. And that oh, no, that no, creates no. staff that go on to form other programs and then that forms other staff that form other programs. Well, and we go yeah, on and on. Uh, yeah. No, the the, the 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 ten people or eleven people that started the Cascade School was the headmaster at Fidu. And ten other people that left there because the kid hung himself, and they thought it was too abusive. They were right. synonym people, right? As well, and that's right. the thing. I'm like, I'm running into people. I'm like, and they're like telling me all this stuff. And I'm like, do you guys know that synonym exists in Germany still? And they're like, holy what? fuck, really? <laughs> yeah, it's a heroin rehab. They make pottery. It's, yeah, you can Google it. It's online. I'm like, I wow. have no idea. And, like, people left from Cascade and went and did Amity. Like, there's so many things. And, like I said, and that's one of the things is I'm sitting there going, my life before Cascade was so abusive with the going to military school, the, the what happened in my household, and other things. Uh, sure. My psychological level, like I said, the thing is, I didn't, my mother was abused growing up. So she overprotected yeah. me so much that I was neglected by my father. And, like, the, so the only people that beat me up were, kids at school making fun of me and, and that kind of stuff. Sure. But like I said, she wasn't protecting me from that. She was shipping me off to that stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so like I said, so I, I became very insecure. And like I said, and it was going through all these other things that kind of made me get a little bit more secure. So I'm kind of, like I said, it's a double-edged sword. There's a lot of things it gave me that was baggage. But it gave me tools to use today that helped me a little bitty bit. But it's, yeah, you know, yeah. There's, a, there's a certain point where there's a break when I try to talk to what I call normies now, non-survivors. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's talking with other survivors that, you know, you can sit here and talk. I mean, like I said, if we were going to literally 
try to discuss the history of the trouble teen industry from 1940 in Texas with the Brown schools to today. That's really not talking much about, you know, um, the rehabilitation therapeutic communities. That's just the trouble teen industry. Yes. But I didn't realize that. And that's one of the things that's what I'm saying. Where there's never going to be a day where I'm not looking into this more, where I'm not trying to help someone else understand this more. Yeah. And it's, 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 I may, I, that's one of the things. I, I want to be angry at my life because of my past because I want to be like, damn it, I deserved better. If my dad had only done this or this had only happened or this had only happened. But, you know, that's not the life I have had. So I had to really yeah. get to that point in my life where I had to really just accept. But I'm proud of the fact that I went through that stuff and it made me a softer, gentler man instead of the angry asshole I could have been. <laughs> Excuse my language. Sure. Sure. And yeah, I'm, great. I'm, I am, I would, I wouldn't want me to go through this again. I wouldn't want, you know, if I went back in time, I would want to try to stop it in some way because I, I'm trying to stop it now for others and I realize no. that, but you know, I, That's that's why I'm so passionate. I don't know any other way. So I'm no, not going to give, yeah. I'm not going to give the program any other credit. That's you know, I, you are speaking out against a specific, the heritage and everything heritage related. And that's what I'm saying. Yes, speak out as much as you can. Scream this stuff. From those. I've done this for five freaking years, calling out freaking Bain Capital and the Worldwide Association of Specialty Programs alone. Yep. That's just the law school, it's the Worldwide Association. Like I said, I, say, well, I can repeat this day in, day out till I'm blue in the face and nothing's happening. Yep. Yeah. So yes, keep doing what you're doing. You're going to become a much more well-grounded, well-rounded individual because of how much you're going to give away because of what you experienced. And no, definitely, you being in that basement, that is something I don't ever even want to imagine. Sorry. It was, uh, no, it was, uh, no. It was quite, quite hellacious. Um, like having to listen to other kids being restrained in the rooms all night sometimes, in the rooms next to me. You know, knowing, like, knowing when, I remember one night this girl came, we were all in the, they, there were, there was a room with bunks that they took us out of our rooms at, our, our cells at, at, at like seven o'clock at night. And we were to get into these bunks and be silent, like not talk to each other at all, not look at each other, not talk. So otherwise we were back in the room again. And this, you know, this sometimes went on all night, you know. Uh, but one night I was in a bunk and I could hear this girl came down. And and, and I think that she had, I, I mean, I, I, I assessed from what I was hearing that she had sliced her wrist open. And they were sewing her her off and they hadn't given her any painkiller and I was listening to this girl scream you know scream and she was just crying hysterically and I never knew who she was because I never saw her face um in the morning I was put back into my room and I didn't see anything after that you know and I mean there was there was there was stuff that I saw like where because this was sort of the area where um where all the incidences were being brought and where all the sort of energy was going to happen, if it was going to happen. Like, uh, I had my uh, door open to myself because I was doing writing assignments and trying to turn in a couple of writing assignments. Um, and this girl came in with these two staff and they were fighting and then she somehow managed to grab the hair of a female staff as they all went down. And she wouldn't let go of this female staff's hair. And she was slamming the female staff's face into the ground. And then the male staff got on top of the girl and started punching her hand, like wailing on her hand to get her to let go. And she wouldn't. And then he began punching her in the face. And there was, like, blood spattered everywhere all over these white walls and I remember like seeing like this, this spatter of blood just flying 
and I knew what was going on. And he said to her, you know, Christina, how do I get you to let go? Finally, like this was the first, probably the first therapeutic thing that was said during the 10 minutes or so that this had gone on, you know, and he asked her, you know, how do I get you to let go? And she goes, I don't know. I'm really sorry. I'm just really scared right now. And really that, that to me was like, why isn't there a therapist here? Why isn't there like someone to talk to this girl who is clearly reacting from being triggered by something that happened? And that, that's what, you know, that's what's going on. And now you're going to assault her. And the second she let go, she was picked up by three staff members, dragged into a timeout room, and the door was closed. And then she started punching the door, so they came in and they restrained her again for a good hour. And I could hear all this. I could hear it. You know, I mean, it's not like we, we weren't there. No, you I, know? That's, I, I, that's so hard to hear for me, you know, because... I remember many times in my past where similar situations happened. And if I hadn't, like I said, I became, when you drink the Kool-Aid, you become cold and callous. Yeah. That's it. I remember after I'd been there a year, a girl was a cutter. And like I said, people like, oh, what's her problem? Oh, she's just a cutter. She's seeking attention. It's not a big deal. She cut a vein. I mean, it was that callous of a conversation I had, but if I had talked to her, it would have been a different conversation. I would never have said something like that. You know, and so that's the thing is I really I had to understand that my words have a lot of meaning when I'm talking to people now, and I can't say certain things because I don't want to be that vicious anymore. I don't want to be that person that is not caring about, you know, okay, so you to this school 20 years ago, get over it. You know, because that's what happens to um, some of the survivor groups I'm in on Facebook, you know, because we graduated back in 91, <coughs> graduated in 2003 from the Cascade School because it didn't even really close down until 2005. <coughs> they come in the group. They just read an article about it. They're wanting to ask questions, and people are going, get over it. It's not that big of a deal. And I'm like going, dude, yeah. you graduated 20 years ago. You don't know how much the school changed after – Within two years of the product, it had changed a lot. And that's the thing is, I guess Heritage had changed from a halfway decent program to a really more abusive program by the time you got there. Well, so, I don't – here's the thing, right? Here's the thing. So I think that 90% of the population of the kids there would not have seen that incident because it was just me and maybe – I don't even know how many kids down there saw the incident. I mean, stuff like that, you you that's witness. Yeah, exactly, and that's, that's why the they had. That's why they have this unit that's across campus, away from the other unit, and it's down well, below. Like that, and like I said, that's why I wish the police or the FBI or somebody would start raiding some of these schools on the watch list because it, when they go and take the tour and, and introduce themselves. They're not going back to that the mill house down the road where the kids are you know, right. isolated away from everyone else because they're deemed troublesome within the community. I mean, that's all but, it takes. All it takes is one little label. You get there within the first week. Oh, he's troublesome. Your whole entire experience can be hell. Yes, you gain a reputation there, and you your your life becomes an endless hell, an endless hell. Right, and that's one of the things I did notice at Cascade was when people came from other programs, they immediately were, oh, here's these privileged you know, like students because they already knew how to play the game. Yeah. So like I, said, I don't know if that happened the same, but like I said, that's the stuff I was noticing. So these places make a lot of money off of kids being shuffled from place to place. Yes. I mean, I said, I've got articles where it talks about $300 million in Texas in 2015 is what was spent in rehabilitation therapeutic communities. Yeah. That's one state. And so, like I said, that's yeah. something I'm saying. Like, this is so much money involved. This is never going to stop. No. You know, so what But that's the other thing. I mean, the other thing is, is, is if the FBI were to raid, there are laws and loopholes that these programs have worked around to be able to do what they're doing. 
nothing they are doing is illegal, although it's horrendous and human rights violations are going on daily, and, you know, sexual abuse, uh, you know, of, of minors is happening, that that right. doesn't, it, it's still in this gray zone. When you enter onto these campuses, you are in a gray zone. Once the parent signs custody away to the school, you're right. The parent is no longer the parent. The school has now become the parent. And that's, and that's, that's one of the things I didn't know my parents kind of did when they agreed for me to go there. They basically gave yeah. their rights to be my parents. I mean, I, I don't know if that actually... It doesn't even matter because they're they're signing away a right to treat you in any way that they deem no, fit. I agree. Yeah. Well, I, you I, know, I think one of the greatest things I ever did, um, Paul Morant did a talk yeah. at the science convention a few years back. Me just hearing him say that the parents deserve a an apology as well as the victims of these schools. Yeah. That really helped me really put myself in place. When yes. I can't be mad at my parents because of this stuff. Like, so that's the thing is I don't think I'm ever going to be cool with my father again. I'd love my father to death. I wish me and my father got along. I wish we didn't bicker over stupid stuff, but you know, we don't see eye to eye on stuff. And I'm trying, I was trying to come to him saying, Hey, dad, I want your help with trying to get these schools investigated. You have a lot of good connections and powerful friends here in Oklahoma. Will you help me out? But, and, and like I said, and I guess after two years of me kind of of harassing him a little bit about it. He got sick and tired of hearing about all these places mm. and me trying to explain this stuff and me wanting him to watch this documentary or this documentary. So, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, 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 I'm upset with my father, but I'm grateful for him because that led me to this point here where you and I are now discussing this on an intelligent level, helping other people come forward. Because that's my whole intention of this is I want anyone yeah. on my Facebook wall that hears this, Anybody that's a survivor to want to come forward and do these survivor series videos. Yeah, we want to, we want to hear your story. We want to hear your story. We are here to listen and we believe you. You know? And that's, yeah, and that's the thing is, you know, girls coming to me saying this counselor raped me and me trying to go to other people from the school saying, hey, did, and they're like going, he'd never do that. That's yeah, really why yeah. I lost a lot of friends. Like this. that's what I don't want anyone else to experience what I've had to experience from people that I called my friends. You know, because there were so many people that I'm like going, man, we went to the school together. We're do or die till the end, you know, kind of people. And then in the last five years, me trying to come to them with this information, well, they went on and did other things, you know, other workshops, yeah. we'll say, that are large group awareness training programs that I didn't understand. And that's one of the things yeah. I'm going, well, I guess if this person got some reward out of this and liked it, I can't be that mad at them for doing it. But I can still try yeah. to point out that, hey, dude, there's our links between this stuff and this stuff and this stuff today that you might not understand. But I would love to take the time to try to talk with you and explain it and have a rational discussion instead of you talking smack about me up behind my back everywhere you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, so, listen, man, I, I'm I'm going to end this. But I just want to tell you that, you know, I love you and thank you so much. And I see you, Survivor. I see you. You know, you are my friend. Thank you. you And and, and you're, you're brave. And I'm so thankful you're there. I'm so thankful you survived. I'm so thankful. You know. Thank you very much. Like I said, it means a lot to me. Um, You've helped me tremendously today. I've never talked about my story. Um, I've had struggles writing about it, too. Um, I haven't talked about Devereaux yet. It's it's really tough for me. I get that. No, you've mentioned two of the schools I've researched, so I know. I get it a little bitty bit. I'll never understand it, though. And that's why I love you. Like so that's to me, even saying that word sometimes is a little difficult. Sure. You know, because to me it's it really like so that's the thing we did at the Cascade School at the towards the end, the last workshop we did, we got a contract. And that's yeah. kinda of why to me, being honest and, and, and having my words mean what I mean it. Mean my, when I say something I totally mean it. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the thing is I didn't understand how many people don't get that just being honest is the best way to be here. And telling yep. your story and owning it is the biggest reward in your life sometimes because you have to 
understand yourself and understand life on life's terms sometimes. And I said, that's the thing is, I don't get it. I don't. I, I wish I could understand life. I wish I could have answer for some people that come to me with help. And I'm like, well, how do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And I'm like, go see a counselor. <laughs> yeah, right. Go do this. So what do you, what do you, I'm saying, well, there's so many people in need right now. But yeah, the only way we're going to get over this stuff is to share our experience, strength, and hope, which is an AA saying. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. So yeah, and, and and thank you, thank you very very much for what you do. This I think your podcast is getting ready to have people beating down their door to talk to you. Oh well, thank you. Well, um, uh, I if you liked listening to this episode, please like and subscribe to our channel. That would really help out a lot. And uh, this has been another episode of the Survivor Podcast on DTV Podcast. Bye. Thank you.